Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in a song with sweet accord. Join in a song with sweet accord. And thus surround the throne and thus surround the throne. We're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful. We're to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly King, but children of the heavenly King, may speak their joys abroad, may speak their joys. Abroad, we're marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. The hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets before we. Before we reach the heavenly fields Or walk the golden streets Or walk the golden streets We're marching to Zion Beautiful, beautiful Zion We're marching upward to Zion The beautiful city of God. Then let our songs abound and every tear be dry. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground. We're marching through Emmanuel's ground to Our next song is page 456, My Lord and I. I have a friend so precious, so very dear to me. He loves me with such tender love. He loves so faithfully. I could not live apart from him. I love to feel him nigh. And so we dwell together, my Lord and I. Sometimes I'm faint and weary. He knows that I am weak. And as he bids me, So 
Sabbath. Sabbath. To welcome everybody here and let you know we have a fellowship meal after the service. So you're all invited to that. My announcements. Just wanted to let you know that Mary died yesterday, yesterday morning. Jerry McIntosh. Um, we're sure sorry to see her go. We want to keep our prayers for the family, keep them in, in our hearts and minds. Yeah, I believe you've got an announcement? Okay. On Wednesday evening at 6 o'clock, there's a prayer meeting here at the church. And uh, Pastor Tom has asked me to make an announcement because for some reason we don't get very many people here. We've been, uh, I don't know, six, eight of us, sometimes ten. So Pastor Tom has said if you will email him, and it's on the back of the bulletin here where it says church officers, if you will email your email address to him, he will give you the link to the Zoom meeting that night so you can participate in prayer meeting via Zoom with those of us who come live, I mean are here live. A few weeks ago I know that Stephen Grove was on with us and uh, it was a nice blessing to have him there and some other people have joined. So if you would like to join prayer meeting on Wednesday night because you can't get out here, that's another way to do it so that you can receive the blessing also. This last Wednesday we just barely got into the book of Esther. He laid the background to it and so we are studying the book of Esther now. So I hope you will join us via email. Let the pastor have your email address and he'll send you the link. Any more announcements? Okay, it's time for our prayer and praise request. Anybody have a prayer or praise request? Raise your hand. We have bring the microphone around to you. Well, God has answered my prayers because I was notified that I might have to move from where I'm at. But they came out, and we talked, and they gave me a 90-day extension. And it says at the end of 90 days, if you still haven't, we'll give you another 90-day extension. So God has been so awesomely gracious in helping me with everything that I need. And I hope that he is helping everybody in this church and everybody that I know in ways that will magnify the name of Jesus Christ. Anyone else? I'd like to thank the Lord for guiding my wife and I safely through the past week. It was her vacation time, so we went over the coast and went up the coast, got to see my son, and had an enjoyable time. But traveling mercies, it was really good. I would like to thank the Lord for. <clears throat> The blessings of this week, getting through it without uh, dying from the heat. Uh, this morning I noticed our air conditioner wasn't working properly. It hadn't cooled the house down, so I shut it off and all of a sudden I heard some noise over at the unit and I pulled the cover off and it was froze solid, which means you don't get much air. So 
It's thought out. It's working now, and I thank the Lord for that. And I thank the Lord for Devin being with us during this last week. He leaves us on Wednesday, which is going to be a sad thing. He's been a good help for us. So I pray for safety for him as he heads back to Alaska, that everything goes well, and that uh, he will get up there again, and it'll be safe, and he'll continue his walk with the Lord. He was baptized here at uh, graduation this year at uh, the church uh, school that he's at. And so we were happy about that, too. So it's been nice to have him here and uh, look forward to him coming again sometime soon. Amen. Well, aloha, everybody. Uh, I just want to thank Jesus Christ for, for everything he has done for, for us. And most of all, for the knowledge he has given this church, the message, and for, for everything, especially the health message, why what so awesome i just want to praise his wonderful name and this wonderful sabbath day which he is given in jesus name i always pray amen amen does this work at this time yep um thanks everybody for prayers from my son uh, he seems pretty upbeat this week he thought he was done he's got two more treatments after all but they're going to give him a three-week break and then go back for the last two. Um, also, I've been having uh, health issues since I had the vaccine and uh, took it upon myself to do some more research after seeing a hematologist who I wasn't real happy with. And my uh, labs came back yesterday and my MP called me and said that my blood sugars are normal now. My A1C is good, my uh, fasting blood sugar, all my other uh, labs are good except for the platelets, which are down in the 50s. So I like prayers that um, I can do that with diet too and find some more things with vitamin K and not uh, do surgery because I'm not going to do that. Um, so thanks, God, and thanks for the prayers for um, traveling. They did finally, after five months, approve my vacation time. So I can now go see my daughter in Virginia. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I actually keep jacking your prayers. Also, um, God's put somebody in my life that um, he, he's been kind of we, we've been kind of like spiritual brothers to each other. Um, I, I've been able to convince him of the, the truth of the Sabbath. I don't know that he's been convicted of that but he understands it you know he, he sent me a text this morning saying happy sabbath and anyways uh, i i'd ask you to keep this gentleman in your prayers his name is matthew and he seems to be on a journey so thank you anyone else yeah i'd like to praise the lord today um a lot of you have heard my testimony, and, and part of my testimony is about uh, right before we, I gave my heart to the Lord, um, my best friend and I, uh, we got in a tussle on the back street, and uh, we left three men laying in the street over a stolen coat. And then shortly after that, the Lord sent a man into our home, and we studied the Bible with him. Well, I could never remember who that third guy was. He was a gentleman that pulled a knife on my friend. and. Um, that started the whole thing off. And anyway, yesterday, um, unbeknownst to me, I thought I was going to run down here to the little uh, uh, Merlin um, secondhand place here and pick up this little uh, portable grill for emergency pack. I saw it earlier in the morning, and I thought about it all day. And so right before 5, I thought, well, I'll run down there and get it. Well, when I went down there, I ran into someone who recognized me and he says hi Ernie and I turned around and he walked up to me and I go uh, remind me of your name again I can't remember and he goes my name's Kendall and we got to talk and I go oh yeah how you doing you know I didn't recognize him He's thinner and everything and so then he asked me a question he goes hey you know we got in a deal down on the back street a um, long time ago about 30 years ago and uh he goes, I was wondering, was that between you and Kenny? And I went, oh, that's you, huh, Kendall? Yeah, and it reminded me of who I was right before I gave my heart to Christ. And 
within about 15 minutes, he had uh, full-on witnessing testimony about Jesus and what, the change that he can make in us. And that he's coming again. He's coming soon. And I handed him one of my Christ Helping Hands cards. And I asked him, you know, Kendall, look, you know who I was and you know who I am now. You can tell. It's, I'm different. Um, if you want to study the Bible, I would love to be able to show you what I found and then let you make up your own mind on what you're going to do. I said, because, and I explained that the Sunday law is coming, and when it comes to pass, you're going to know what I said is true. And I said, you can see things already getting, turning in that direction. And um, anyway, I gave him my Christ Self and Hands card, and I just wanted to thank this church for its generosity. Um, for Christ Helping Hands and those that, without even being asked, uh, began to support it. Um, because, because of that, I'm able to do things like that. And I'm able to go and get my friend off the mountain and bring him down. And I run into him around town, and everywhere we went Wednesday, um, I ran into someone that I knew from my past. Everywhere. And my friend, he's a non believer and he believes the Sabbath, but he don't believe our message. And he was going, Man, the Lord must have something he wants you to tell them. <laughs> One lady at the farmer's market, she just goes, Your name's Ernie, isn't it? And I looked at her and I go, Well, you look familiar, but I don't know you. And she goes, Well, my name's Carol, da da da, your old friend of Jeter, uh, Skeeter. And, and she started rattling off names, and I was like just, and by the time I left, she was holding my card and she was triple taken at it. All week long I've had to hand that card out, and people have been triple taken at that card. And I just want to thank you for supporting Christ's helping hands and the fact that Jesus is coming again. Amen. Amen. Uh, last week I had mentioned that my sister had had a major stroke. And uh, she passed away on Monday. So uh, her son's name is Brian. I'd appreciate it if we could remember Brian in prayer. Anyone else? Okay, it's time for our scripture reading. I'll be reading from Psalms 119. Verses 129 and 130. 129. Thy testimonies are wonderful, therefore doth my soul keep them. The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. We need to take his word into our hearts. Now time for our prayer, and you, as many as can kneel, and we'll have prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and just thank you for this day. We thank you for your care and guidance through the past week. We pray for Jack McIntosh and his family, just lost wife and mother. We just pray for each of them that they can go through this time and, and come to know you better and to know that you're working in their lives. Be with each one of us through the coming week. Help us to know you better. Pray for all the prayer requests today that don't remember all of them, with names anyway. But you know them, Lord, and you know what to do to help them. Just thank you now for sending your son to, work, to die for us. And we just thank you for raising him to, so we can walk in newness of life, too. We pray that Sean will bring us your word and that we will take it into our hearts. Let your Holy Spirit work in each one of us today as we go forward in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship.
we invite you to stand as we sing our opening song, page 262, Sweet, Sweet Spirit. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and I know that it's the spirit of the Lord. There's a sweet expression on each face, and I know Now time for tithes and offerings. Today's loose offering will be for the local church budget and whatever you deem in your envelopes. We worship with our offerings and donations because he invites us to care for others as he does. One day the crowd noticed the movement of Jesus and his disciples and came to meet them. Full of compassion, Jesus spent the entire day teaching, blessing, and healing. It was a spiritual feast. As the sun was lowering in the sky, disciples asked Jesus to send the crowd away to seek food. The crowd would soon get hungry, and there was no bakery in the desert. But instead of attending to their quite sensible request, he invited them to give them something to eat. This unexpected answer reveals Jesus' concern for both the spiritual and temporal needs of people. This is also our mission. When we see human beings in distress, whether through affliction or through sin, we shall never say, this does not concern me. We are a mission here in this area. Some of us live a ways away, but in, in your area, we all are missionaries. We are to take the word to everyone, as Ernie was speaking about. He's not the only one to do it. The pastor's not the only one. All of us need to take the word from here and go out into the world and spread it. So offering here helps us keep doing that. This church is a lighthouse for the community. We need to keep it in good shape so that people can see that we care about this place. And when we talk to them, they'll know we care about them too. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and thank you for this day. We thank you for this time we can come to return to you a portion of what you've given to us. Lord, it all belongs to you. Help us to know that. Be with us now and keep us through this week. In Jesus' name, amen.
Now time for our scripture reading. We'll be reading John 16, verse 7. John 16, verse 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. The Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now we'll turn the time over to Sean Murphy. Thank you. Are we on? Hey, we're on. All right. Good morning, church. I'm just curious about something. Um, would, uh, would it mess you guys up back there if I was to actually be down there instead of up here? That little PTZ can follow me? Yeah? All right. The only thing is, is how do I raise this up? Let's see. There we go. That'll work. I don't need to be up on a pedestal anyway, right? It has been quite a while since I've actually been here. So, see some new faces. Um, I have to be careful how I say this. I see some old faces. Uh, Harry, if you have a guilty conscience, you have to deal with that. <laughs> Um, we're going to leave it right there. How's that sound? Um, before I get into the sermon, I, I love the way God works out details of things because I like to actually show up for Sabbath school um, when I'm speaking somewhere because it always seems like there's something in Sabbath school that happens that actually shows, thank you, Lord, for actually having me speak today on what was something that actually was somewhat spoken of in there. So um, the idea of seeing what we're seeing in the world today and the fact that you know, there, there's people that are calling for the church militant, well, the church should not should be an army, but it shouldn't be something to where we actually start literally using swords on people. And that's part of what we saw there. So Ellen White talks about the church militant prior to the church triumphant, um, but we have to make certain that we understand the type of army that we're marching with. And the only way to do that is for the Holy Spirit to be a voice that we undeniably recognize. That's absolutely positively mandatory as we move forward from, from this day forward. Because if, if we don't, I will tell you this much, that the devil is much smarter than any of us. And if we think somehow that we can not be deceived by him, talk to the third of the angels that followed him that were perfect beings. They used all their brain. I think we're lucky if we use 1%. So we're pea brains compared to them. So um, anyway, so you'll, you'll see as we go along um, what, what I'm talking about. So, but before we go any further, I'd just like to pray and uh, ask the Spirit to fill our hearts and minds. Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for this awesome responsibility to share your word this morning. And I want to thank you also, Lord, that we don't walk this life that we live on this earth alone because you promised to walk with us. And so, Father, as we, as we go through this message today, I just hope that you would please convict us of our need to hold on to your righteous right hand, because if we don't, success is definitely not guaranteed. But if we do, it is. And so, Lord, I pray that the messenger would be pulled out of this message and that your, your word would ring true. But most of all, Father, I pray that each one of us will have a deeper desire to seek you before we leave here today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we're going to start this lecture with a quiz. Did you study? No? I, I, I sent something out and none of you got it? 
No? None of you? All right. Well, there's going to be a quiz. So, in the Jewish economy, would you agree that it was very much tied to agriculture? Right? All right. So, there was, there was something that was coming into just after planting. What is it that would fall that would actually kick off the growing season? The early rain. Or the, so, what would be the spiritual equivalent of the early rain? What did you say? Say it louder. Pentecost. Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit was rained down on the church, and there was unbelievable inflow into the church. All right? So, the crops start to grow, and shortly before the harvest, what is it that fell to actually push it through to the harvest? The latter rain, good. Spiritual equivalent of that is? Well, it was the latter rain, and this is the latter rain. <laughs> it's the same answer. The latter rain. Um, the loud cry is going to come, absolutely, but the latter rain is going to fall, and that's going to push to the harvest. So let me read this to you. This is from Testimonies, Volume 5. We should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. If they needed it at that time, we need it more today. Would you agree? Moral darkness, like a funeral pile, covers the earth. Agreed? In this world. Sorry? 158. All manner of false doctrines, heresies, and satanic deceptions are misleading the minds of men. Are we living it? Without the Spirit and power of God, it will be in vain that we labor to present the truth. So let me ask you a question. It says that if they need it at that time, we need it more today. All manner of false doctrines, heresies, and satanic deceptions are misleading the minds of men. Have you seen any of those? Let me ask you then, how is it that we can avoid those? We'll answer that question further as we go along. So, thank you for reading the, the text today. Uh, John 16, verse 7. Let's look there again. I'm going to read it from the New King James Version, but I really like, there's one word that I really, really like that the King James Version that you read um, uses because uh, it says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper is what the King James Version said, or I'm sorry, New King James Version says, but the, the King James Version said, the comforter. How many of you need help today? Well, I saw a couple hands go up. The rest of you guys actually don't know you need help, but you need help. But how many of you need comfort today? It's expedient that, that I go away so that I can send that to you. Why is it that the Holy Spirit needed to be sent? Jesus is described as the Word become flesh, right? He left everything behind, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, all of the omnis that you could think of, he left behind, and he became limited to time and space, just like we are. I mean, it's kind of a cool thing. I mean, at one point in time, years ago, these four walls would be the only thing that, and, and you guys would, would be what would hear my voice today. But of course, because of the little camera up there, um, it's going to go above and beyond here. That's, that's a very cool thing, isn't it? But Jesus' ministry was actually limited by his humanity. Except, Jesus' ministry actually continues through this book. Jesus' ministry continues through the work of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus' ministry continues 
in the lives of each of us. That's how Jesus' ministry continues, but it's still limited in our sphere. It's limited by time and space. But the Spirit is not limited by time or space. Isn't that good news? So, let's turn to Colossians 1.27. I'm going to pass through some same things quickly, so I may not actually have you end up getting to the verses, but I'm going to pass through these things quickly. To them, God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. How is it that Christ is in us? Have you actually addressed that question in your mind before? How is it that Christ is in us, the hope of glory? By the way, glory, if you take a look at that word glory, if you translate that back, you can actually take that word and it's, at, it's Christ in you, the hope of character, the hope of his character. But it's through the Spirit that we can only have Christ in us, the hope of glory. That's it. So a couple thoughts really struck me. Number one, the Spirit is our conduit to Christ. Number one. Number two, The very God of the universe wants to be that intimate with each and every one of us. So the question is this. I have to be be careful how how blunt I am here today, but um, so I'll try to be at least, I won't be politically correct maybe, but I'll be correct. Why is it that we, even in the church, function with so little power. The lack of the Spirit, unbelief. And so we're told Christ can be in us the hope of glory, but yet we function with so little power. We're told that literally He would pour out the fullness of, and we say, give me a little... Now, I don't know about you and and your situation, but I will tell you that there's times where I'm much more content with a sip than a fire hose. But God's saying, I will unload the heavenly fire hose. Dwight Moody actually put it this way. And if we are not filled, it is because we are living beneath our privileges. So it's a privilege and an honor, literally, to have the Holy Spirit filling me. And I say, but I've had enough, Lord. That's, ah, that, yeah. And God's saying, how about the fullness? So here's a promise from Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly baptized with water... But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, what's the context here? Tell me. You can talk to me, by the way. What's the context here? Keep going. What is the context of Acts chapter 1, verse 5? What's going on here? And they were seeking after it like never before. That's the context. So let me ask you a question. Do you think Scripture should be deeply personal? Would you agree with that? Okay, so don't read this as a message to the gathered disciples anymore. So from here on, read this as if this is actually a letter to you. So now let's read it again. But this is a letter to you and a letter to me. Now you ready? For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. How many of you would agree that we're living in the last days? Would you agree with that? 
So the Holy Spirit is waiting. The Holy Spirit is waiting and saying, I just want to be poured out on you not many days from now. The question is, are we going to follow what it is that the disciples were doing around this time? Did you hear what our brother said? What did you say? Say it louder. Hopefully. So let me ask you a question. Does the spirit of prophecy describe the early rain? Yes or no? Okay. Does the spirit of prophecy describe... The latter rain. And you know what it's described as? It will make Pentecost pale in comparison. It will make Pentecost absolutely pale in comparison. So when the latter rain power falls on us, the church, it is going to be a movement that is unprecedented in the history of humankind. That is going to be an unbelievable Powerful experience. In fact, Acts 1 verse 8, a few verses down, says this, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When are we going to receive power? What's it say? When are we going to receive power? When? You guys, don't be afraid. Talk to me. It's all right. So, are we ready to do that work? It says, it says that we will start in Jerusalem, which is where this was most likely being written, And then it says, but then you're going to move out to Judea, then to Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. So where does the power and the work start for us? Right here. Now, mind you, foreign missions, absolutely, positively, foreign missions have have unbelievable success. Why? Because they're hungry and and they desire it, right? But here in North America, we're rich and increased with goods. Meh. I don't really need much. But we need a ton, brother. We need a ton. You raised your hand. Yes. Okay. How is it that we are born again? It's only by way of the Spirit. It's only by way of the Spirit. So can we then, the church, can we do a work? Yes? But can we have a powerful powerful work outside of the Spirit? We can still continue to do... There's people right now that are saying, I work for God that aren't working under the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'm not judging anybody. All I'm simply saying is, is they're doing a work, but just think if the Holy Spirit was actually the driver. If the Holy Spirit was actually the driver and Christ was the center, oh man, you wouldn't have very many empty seats in here or in any of our churches for that matter. And when the Spirit comes in like that, do you think that people are going to be drawn to that? So, how is it that people out there, out there, would actually be drawn powerfully in here? I can tell you that, that our brother Ernie is on to something because he's running into people and he's just saying, you know what? You want me to tell you what it is that Jesus did for me? Jesus is the center of it and the Spirit drives it. Amen? Amen. Jesus is the center, but the Spirit drives. Not the 
You know, I got to tell you something real quick. He, he distracted me. I'm just, it's your fault. You distracted me. So there's this one guy that went to our church in California. We went to this little country church in Sutter Creek, California. And um, this one guy had that sticker that said, God's my co-pilot. So this, this evangelist came in and he said, you know what my pet peeve is? That whole thing that says, God is my co-pilot. Because God isn't my co-pilot. God's the pilot and you're just along for the ride. And, and so what was funny is that the next week at church, he had taken a black marker and, and just marked out the co. So there's this big black square where he marked out the co. And, and so, so God was now his pilot, at least according to uh, the, the uh, magic marker. Um, so how, how is it, by the way, now back to our regular scheduled program, um, how is it that this power was feeding the Pentecost experience. How is it? What were they doing? They were praying for it. They were seeking after it. Absolutely. Repenting. Yes. By the way, does repentance come naturally? Repentance does not. In fact, repentance in and of itself is an actual gift from God. We need to make certain that we grab a hold of that gift from God and respond to the giving of the gift. So let's read about it. Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. What does it, to be, what does it mean to be with one accord? In agreement, we have the same purpose. We're striving after the same things. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Filled the entire house. Very key. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I say that for emphasis because we're just about to actually hear something and I don't have any hair, but the hair that I do have, whenever I tell these, these two stories, um, it stands straight up on end, even taller than it is now. <laughs> but here's the thing. In Sabbath school, it talked about the fire of the Holy Spirit. We call down fire! So did John, James and John requested to call down fire, and Jesus said, you don't even understand exactly. You don't understand. So the idea of saying, Jesus, you want us to call down fire? No, Jesus is saying, I will give you fire that will set you on fire, set the world on fire. But we're not to call down fire. And I'll tell you what, back there, they were saying, let's call down fire. Let's burn this place down. That's not the militant we need to be. What's that? That's not being a lot of things. But we won't go there. I won't get that distracted. I can go down rabbit trails, but I'm not going to go down that one. So this is, this is a book that was written. James Beshires, Jr., he's a former Pentecostal minister who became an Adventist, and he wrote a book about some of his experiences within the Pentecostal church. By the way, if there's anybody who left or is currently a part of the Pentecostal church, this is not aimed at you. This is aimed specifically at a principle that we need to understand about tongues specifically. All right? He was very much convinced that what he was seeing and what he was hearing was truly not a movement that was of the Lord. What he was really seeing was something that was actually driven by Satan that was meant to confuse the church. So, in one meeting I was in, a certain person spoke in a tongue and another gave the interpretation. Then a third person stood up, a visitor. He said, I'm a Jew. I have heard of the gift of tongues and I came to see what it was all about. That was Hebrew that that person was speaking, but he was not praising God as the so-called interpreter said he was doing. Instead, he was cursing God. So the interpreter said, oh, praise God, is what this person just said. But the person who actually literally spoke Hebrew and understood Hebrew said it was a curse to God. Do we need wisdom and discernment that can only come from the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. On another occasion, when I was present, a local member gave an utterance, and he was interpreted as saying, I am God, give me your worship and praise. Time out. We'll just stop right there. That's not the end of the story, okay? But we need to stop right there. Red flag, would you agree? By the way, do you guys have good Adventist radar? I mean, that Adventist radar that you see something and it goes, whoop, whoop, whoop. This is Adventist radar. It should be on right now. Why? God never, ever, ever demands worship. God says, I want you to see me for who I am. I want you to understand the love that I have for you in sending my son Jesus to die for your sins. That's how much I love you. And when we see God, the Father, and Jesus for who they are, then we're just drawn and we say, absolutely, I'm going to drop on my knees. I'm going to praise and worship. <clears throat> By the way, if my voice breaks, let me just pause for just a second. This is my first time preaching. Four and a half weeks ago, I had a brand new disc put into my C6, C7. Um, and you can't see it, but my little scar is about right here. Um, and they pull your throat aside, stretch it all out. Darling, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, so this is the first time I've given a, a sermon. And so if my voice breaks, it's because my throat is not completely back yet. Um, so, it, it, uh, all right, anyway. So it's, it's, it's not because um, I, you know, uh, my voice is breaking because I'm that young. <laughs> so we need to make certain that we understand the spirit we're of. And we need to understand the spirit. Again, let's refer back to Sabbath school. I really love it, that Sabbath school today, the spirit that that was. Let me ask you, uh, how many of you guys were in Sabbath school? All right. So when that was going on, and they were saying, you know, we decree, what was the spirit that you felt? It was angry. It was militant. It's like, let's go, mm, mm. And, and that's, that's what it was. And I, I can tell you this much, that's not the spirit we need to be of. Amen. That's not the spirit we need to be of. But so, and, and to say, we demand drop in worship. Red flag. Adventist radar turned on. But there was a couple visiting that night from New York. The man stood and introduced himself. He said, I have visited Pentecostal meetings several times, but I've never before heard anyone speaking in tongues. I came tonight because I wanted to hear what it was like. I am Italian, and that message was in Italian, but instead of I am God, as the interpreter said, the message is actually this. I am Satan, and I am your Lord and Master. Woo! My hair is standing all the way up. Do you think that it's going to be any easier to navigate through what it is that's going to come as powerful, powerful deception? So we're told the Spirit's a comforter and the Spirit's a helper because if we didn't have that help, there's no way in this world that we could have any hope of not being deceived. But if the Spirit is actually a voice I recognize, then spiritual wisdom and discernment is going to come only through the Spirit because I'm not smart enough to recognize it. Some of you might be, but I'm not smart enough to recognize. So let me ask you this question. Why is it, and by the way, I am not here to speak bad about our church, okay? I'm just here to be honest and upfront. So here's a question. Why is it that we in our churches, all of our churches, do not have a more powerful manifestation of the Spirit? What's that? That's a sad statement, isn't it? That's a sad statement, isn't it? Did you hear what he said? Yeah. It's not safe for us to have it. If I was a crazy man and you gave me a, a fully automatic weapon and I was a crazy man, don't give it to me here because you guys are sitting ducks. And frankly, if the spirit was actually poured out in full measure, would we wield it properly? But there's something else, too, because that Adventist radar that we have, and I'm not going to make that noise again because some of you probably are annoyed by going whoop, whoop. Anyway, 
I did it, didn't I? Yeah. Okay. She she said she said that we have to have the testimony of this of, of the spirit to be able to recognize these things. I that was my version of it. She didn't say it exactly that way, but I had the gift of interpretation. Uh, is it correct? Right. So, but so so there's there's something else that we have to do too. When the Adventist radar goes off, we have to make sure that even that radar is properly placed. Why? Because I'll, I'll tell you something, we oftentimes talk about, I don't want to be involved with the counterfeit. I don't want to be, you want to come sit up here, Harry? Well, the speaker went off, so we're having trouble back here. All right, because I, either that or he's saying, preach to me, brother, because Harry's back there going like this. Um, okay, all right, all right. Um, anyway, we fear the counterfeit. So sometimes our Adventist radar goes off and we say, oh, you, you can't trust that. What we really need to do is pray, Lord, help us to have the discernment that can only come by way of the Holy Spirit. And that way we won't be deceived. We fear the counterfeit, but the problem is we have to make certain that we don't have paralysis by analysis. Because if, in fact, we function that way, we're never going to go anywhere. Am I doing the wrong thing? Because we're told that you hear a voice behind you whether you turn to the left hand or to the right. But the church is in motion, amen? The church is in motion. So let me ask you this. Do you know how the FBI is trained in how to recognize counterfeit currency. Tell me about it, Harry. Never look at the counterfeit. Don't look at the counterfeit. Ever. In fact, here's exactly how they do it. They literally put them in a room, and the only thing that they have is the real. They, they breathe it. They smell it. They feel it. They know its texture. They know every single little security measure that is in it, and that's all they ever have. So here's what ends up happening. Counterfeit, counterfeit, counterfeit. That's real. How is it that we can recognize the counterfeit? By knowing the real. If this is the real, we need to make sure that this is what we study. We have to make sure that this is what we study. So that it's very glaring when it becomes that. And, and that way, our Adventist radar is very well placed. And I'm not making fun of the Adventist radar. I'm just simply saying. So let me ask you, do any of you guys know of a guy named Cody Francis? Some of you might know him. Harry, you might know him because he's good friends with Christian Berdahl. So Cody Francis, let me tell you, now this is the true gift of tongues. So Cody Francis was in Africa, and he's speaking along in an evangelistic series in Africa. And his interpreter is going like this. And Cody's kind of like, what do you keep looking at me like that for? And he's just like, when he was done, Cody actually went to the back and then people were greeting him, and they came up and they said, you speak our language beautifully. And he said, I was speaking English. Oh, no, 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 that's not what I heard. That's not what I heard. I got to be friends with Ty Gibson a little bit, and he was actually saying something else about the true gift of tongues. He was supposed to have an interpreter, and, he just, and, and the interpreter didn't show up, and there were there was some people that only spoke Spanish there. And he's like, Lord, somehow you're going to have to interpret this. And he prayed, Lord, you're going to have to interpret this. And it was all said and done. They walked up to Ty and they said, you spoke our language perfectly. That's the true gift of tongues. Why? Because the gift of tongues was given to the church so that the church will be lifted up and edified. That's 
what the gift of tongues is all about. So if the, if the church is confused, oh, wait a minute, the only way to understand that is for one person, one person who's actually supposed to tell everybody else what it means. We heard from this story that there were people that had the gift of interpretation that misinterpreted. Because we're told this, that everyone heard in their own tongue. That's the gift of tongues. You see the difference? So later in Acts chapter 2, when the, once the Holy Spirit had moved, Peter preached this absolutely amazing sermon. Could you imagine? I mean, those of you who, who give sermons, could you imagine like if one person came up and was so on fire that they said, I want to give my life to the Lord, I want to be baptized, I want, I want to have Bible studies, and, and, and let's be baptized. How excited would you be? One person. Multiply that times 3,000, and that one day, Peter actually brought 3,000 people, or the, the Spirit brought 3,000 people to the church. Could you imagine? I mean, it would be like, oh, what? I mean, talk about humbling. Lord, one person came to the Lord because of something you had me say today. Praise God! And Peter said, praise God times 3,000. Isn't that something? Lord, please give us even close to that. Even close to it. But you, I want you to notice something. Peter spoke the words that the Spirit gave. Very key. Peter spoke the words that the Spirit gave. But who is it that brought about the conviction from those words? So that's, that's another thing, too. Sometimes um, those of you, um, those of us who have given Bible studies and so on, the one thing that we tend toward is we want conviction and we want it right now. So what do we do? We say, you need to bring conviction right now, right now, right now. So there was, there was a lady, um, she came up to me. I was preaching at a, an area a church here recently, and she came up to me and said, hey, can I talk to you? And I said, Sure. And she said, you know, uh, th this idea of, of having patience and letting God work is so very, very key. She said, this one lady came and she said, I want to have Bible studies. So I came for the first Bible study. Okay. And she said, but the lady didn't study the Bible with me. She just talked about what was going on with her. And so she's like, well, you know, she needed to talk today. And they were going to meet once a week. So they talked. And they talked, and they talked, and they talked, and they talked. And then she said, I wanted to respect your time, so we're going to do an hour. That's it, an hour. So the hour went by, and she said, well, um, I'd like to pray with you. So they prayed together. She left. Every week, once a week, for one year. That's how it went, for one year. And then the lady, after about a year, looked at this lady who's talking to me, and she, she said, I'm ready to start studying the Bible. But before we do, I wanted to say something. What I really needed was for somebody to feel like they were coming alongside me and just putting their arm around me and letting me just talk because I've been going through so much. But if she had forced the conviction, decide for Jesus from the human side of things, it could have ended it. But this lady for a year was just her friend met with her once a week, wanted to study the Bible, and it took a year, and finally the lady said, let's open up the Bible. And she was, at that point in time, this is a few months ago, she was at that point in time still studying with the lady, and the lady was dead serious about being prepared for baptism. But it took a year of being a friend and not actually ramming the, the idea of conviction because it's not my place to convict. I witnessed my friend's father's baptism 25 years after his mother started praying for her husband. 25 years. So if the Lord is going to take 25 years, we're just going to have to let him take 25 years. Of course, nowadays, I don't think we have 25 years left. That's my personal opinion. So that means we need to be more in earnest. Would you agree? Earnest. <laughs> there you go, Ernie. All right. Acts 2, verse 38. Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let you use the word repentance, didn't you? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. How many does the Lord our God call? Everybody. How many people are going to answer? We don't know the answer to that question. How many are going to answer? We don't know. But what we do know is that the Lord's calling everybody. Because he's not going to discriminate. He's calling everybody. But do we hear it? Do we respond? And that's what you were getting at right there when you just said that. Is, is, is there going to be that type of response? We don't know. But what we do know is that we're called upon to have the Spirit help us to actually share whatever we can share whenever we can share. But the Holy Spirit's promise to us, did you hear the promise? This promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God calls. It's a promise. And God's promises are faithful, period. Or as they say in New Zealand, full stop. So what could the church accomplish if we were to pray like they did at Pentecost? I have to tell you that there's so many times to where I'm so slow to pray. But I will tell you this, that if we were to pray like as at Pentecost, we would be absolutely just shocked and amazed at what God would do. Would you agree? And and here's something that would be said. 1 Corinthians, Paul says it this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 Verse 24, and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, and he is convicted by all. By who? It says the unbeliever comes in. So so who's this talking to? The church. An unbeliever would come in here. Would they be able to say what's going to come in verse 25? And thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and repart that God is is truly among you. Did you get that? An unbeliever comes in and walks into this place and simply says, God is in this place. I know it. Why? Because the Spirit's different here. The Spirit's different. And they know it. And it says they're deeply convicted by it because the Spirit's different here. Do we want to be different that way? Do we really want to be different that way? So I want to talk about, um, this is way back in our church history. There was a man, uh, he is called, let's see here, Brother, I love it how Ellen White actually shares the principle, but she doesn't actually share the name because she doesn't necessarily want to actually embarrass anybody. We need to learn that, by the way. We need to learn that. But that's an aside. This man, the, in the early days of the church, shortly before the great disappointment, the promptings and the movings of the Holy Spirit were amazing and powerful. If you want to read something, read um, the, the six-volume set that Arthur White wrote about the history of the church in regards to and how it revolved around Ellen White's life. Um, it's like that. the early years, the Elmshaven years, the Australia years. Those are all the titles. Anyway, excellent books. I plowed through this. Over 2,000 pages, I plowed through those things. Excellent books. But this man had a problem because he was going around saying, oh, I, 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 don't, I don't know about this. And he was voicing his doubt to everybody that would listen to him. Everybody who would listen to him. You know what Ellen White did? What do you think she did? You think she grabbed that man, threw him down, and called him out on the table? You know what Ellen White did? She said, I'm going to pray for that man. I'm going to pray for that man. And this is the story of what happened as a result of her prayers. Listen to this. This is powerful. Almost as the desire went up from my heart, Brother R., fell prostrated by the power of God, crying, Let the Lord work! My heart is convicted that I have been warring against the Holy Spirit, but I will grieve it no more by stubborn unbelief. Okay, so, so let's stop right there. There is the possibility that we could actually express some doubt of the movings of the Holy Spirit that could literally be fighting against the moving of the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to understand the difference 
Because if we're fighting against the Holy Spirit, we don't win the battle. We don't. Welcome light. Welcome Jesus. I have been backslidden and hardened, feeling offended at anyone, praise God, and manifested a fullness of joy in his love. That's a key. Somebody was manifesting the fullness of joy in his love, and I was saying, what's going on here? I don't like this. That's what this man was doing. But now my feelings are changed. My opposition is at an end. Jesus has opened my eyes, and I may yet shout his praises myself. Isn't that good news? Stop voicing the doubt and start expressing the praise. But who is it that can help us to change what direction we are with that? The Holy Spirit. And if we have not the Spirit, we may actually doubt something that's actually the Spirit in motion. That's why we need spiritual discernment that we don't currently have, myself included. Do you think Satan's happy about that? No, and that's why he would move a mind to doubt something that's actually coming straight from the Holy Spirit. Manuscript, verse, uh, manuscript 25 um, from January 28, 1910 says this, Light has been coming to me that unless we have more evident movings of the Spirit of God and greater manifestation of divine power working in our midst, many of God's people will be overcome. Lord, help us. Satanic agencies will come in, and as they came to me, just as they came to me. If you read about the experience, like life sketches of James and Ellen White and, and so on, if you read, the, Ellen White was absolutely positively pounded by the devil. Every step of the way. And the only way that we can't get beat up by that is if we have a more powerful moving of the Holy Spirit in our personal lives. But we cannot afford to yield to the power of the enemy. We can't afford it. So um, I had the amazing opportunity to go with Christian Berdahl again. I keep pointing to Harry because Harry knows Christian Berdahl from way back. Um, and so Christian asked if I would come to New Zealand um, and we, did, we got to preach various places around New Zealand. One of the places that we were preaching was um, at a youth Bible camp near Kakahi, North Island. We got there, and the first night I was asleep, and in a dream off in the distance, I saw something that I wasn't sure what it was, but I knew that it just troubled me. So it was way off in the distance. And as it came closer, it looked like the beast um, that, the, that is not named in Daniel and so on in prophecy. It kind of looked sort of like that. And then, you know, of course, it has these humongous iron teeth. But off in the distance, it troubled me. But as it got closer, it started to get me more and more and more and more and more concerned. And as it got closer to me, I actually started moving from just concerned to frightened. And as I was flipping myself out of the bed I was sleeping in and screaming, instantly I was just yelling, we need to pray. And I just hit the ground, hit my knees, and Christian's like, what are you doing? I'm like, we need to pray, we need to pray. And then after I calmed down a little bit, I processed it. And you know what? Just the reason I flipped out of bed was because those iron teeth came wide open and literally they were next to my head. What was the message? What you're about to do with these young people, I don't want you to say. And, and, and the devil was saying what his goal was. I am going to bite your head off. So let me tell you this. Um, when we were there, we actually wanted these kids to actually ask this question, why are you a Christian? And almost, almost to, a, to a person, they would, you know, my, my, my parents say I should, or you know, I, just, I feel duty bound and, and stuff like that. But we counted them and there was one short. 
and we knew exactly who it was. This one kid, they flew him from Fiji to New Zealand, and he wanted to be at a soccer camp that week because he was, he was an amazing soccer player. He wanted to be at a soccer camp, and he was so upset. And his parents were going to actually be driving all around the North Island in an RV while he was at some stupid youth camp. And that was his posture. But Christian and I made it a point of coming alongside him. And then uh, Doug Hurley, um, who is the one that brought us over there, he came alongside. And, and we just started to really just try to talk to this kid and let him know, hey, um, we're here to let you know um, that we just wanted to show the love of God, and we did, and we showed him the love of God. And this is really cool. So when, when we were speaking, we were here, the kids were sitting here, boys' bathroom here, girls' bathroom here. There's 2004, and I remember it were plain as day. And we started reading what these kids wrote at the end. We asked the same questions. But the, the main one, why are you a Christian? And it went from my parents said I should to I want to know Jesus better because of what happened here today. But we were still one short. And I, I, Hollywood couldn't have done it any better. So Christian's sitting here, I'm sitting here, and there's, there's kind of a bench on, on an angle. And the door hinge, you know in Hollywood, all door hinges in Hollywood need more WD-40, right? Right? It's like, my goodness, WD-40, that thing. But I kid you not, it was that loud of a squeaky hinge. And around the corner comes this arm with the paper that had the questions on it. And that young man actually said, I really do want to know Jesus. Why did the, why did the devil want to bite my head off? Because he didn't want my voice to speak back. And of course I said, well, why didn't you act like you wanted to bite Christian's head off? But that never happened. It happened to me. I don't know. What's the point? The devil wants to bite our heads off. If we actually share a message that's going to turn people to Jesus. Yes, the devil's not happy, but guess what? Greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and this is a message to us. And it shall come to pass in the last days. Are we there? If we believe that, then what we're about to read is a message that's supposed to be read personally. Says God that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions your old men shall dream dreams, and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. He'll do what with his spirit? Pour it out. He, what he really wants to do is completely empty the ministry of the Holy Spirit onto us. But are we going to recognize it? Did you hear this honest answer? You didn't. Hopefully. Hopefully. So what we need to do is say, Lord, we're going to make the promise that you give us hope that is founded in Christ. Because then it's not just, well, hopefully. It's, no, we have hope. And there's a difference. And who shall be saved? Who shall be saved? That all, everybody who answers that call, right? Everybody who answers that call. So, so sometimes we, we say, you know, there, there could be, in Egypt, how many miracles that Moses did were the Egyptians able to replicate? Whatever ones God allowed them to replicate. That's it, right? How many miracles could the devil try to replicate nowadays? So would we say the... If, if there were miracles, it could be a moving of the Holy Spirit or it could be a counterfeit. Right? Would you agree? But let me ask you this. What is the evidence of the true moving of the Holy Spirit and God's people? Say that louder. I agree with you, Harry, to the law and to the testament, Isaiah 820. Yes, I agree with that. 
wholeheartedly, but say what you said. Say, say it loud. The fruit of the Spirit. Why? The devil's not allowed to replicate that. He doesn't know how to grow it. He doesn't know how to grow it. So here it is. Let's read it. Because this is the truth of the promptings if we yield to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. It's the transformed life of you and I that actually shows people that the Holy Spirit has power. And by the way, when Jesus comes back, what's he going to be looking for? What's he going to be looking for? Because he's going to see through all of this, and he, what he's going to see is himself. He's going to see a reflection of himself. And I will tell you this, the Lord needs to do a big work in my character still. Thank you, Lord, in your mercy. You have not come yet because I need to have you change me in a mighty, 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 mighty way. But guess what? He's faithful. He'll do the work. But what's our place in it? We need to surrender. Let him do the work. It is the, this is Christ's Object Lessons, page 69. It is the privilege of every Christian not only to look for, but to hasten the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, I have been a little bit long-winded. I am almost done. How is it that we could be a part of the hastening of the coming of the Lord? How is it that we could be a part of that? It's only through the movings of the Spirit on our hearts. That's it. And I will tell you, all the stuff that we're seeing, all the stuff that, for instance, we watched in, in, in Sabbath school, powerful stuff. I've actually seen a bunch of stuff from that guy, and, and he gets after it. But we need to make certain that when we see all of this stuff, that we understand that the only way to really respond appropriately is that the Holy Spirit would make our minds able to even see it and discern it. That's it. So I'm going to read a couple things one of which we've already read, but I want to actually emphasize it again. We're told if we hear something once, we should hear it. But if it's repeated a second time, we need to make certain that we hear it. So here's the, the first one. It is all essential. Did you get that? It's all essential for the Christian to understand the meaning of the promise of the Holy Spirit. It is all essential, she says. Just prior to the coming of the Lord Jesus the second time. And here we are. Talk of it. Pray for it. Preach concerning it. For the Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit than parents are to give good gifts to their children. It is all essential. So let's read again what we read toward the start, and we'll close with this. We should pray as earnestly for the descent of the Holy Spirit as the disciples prayed on the day of Pentecost. If they needed it more at that time, we need it more today. Moral darkness like a funeral pall covers the earth. All manner of false doctrines, heresies, and satanic deceptions are misleading the minds of men. Without the spirit and power of God, it will be in vain that we labor to present the truth. So we need to really ask ourselves this one last question, and that's this. Do we want our work to be filled with power, or do we want our work to be filled with vanity? And if we want it to be filled with power, and I, I will tell you this, I, I sometimes have a power shortage. I'm, gonna just, I'm just gonna just open myself bare to, to you guys. Sometimes I can actually feel completely powerless at times. But I will tell you this, that God is saying that if you would seek me like they did then, you will have a power that you've never, ever seen in your life before. Ever. And you know what? Joy is such a huge part of it. You know, it's like, Jesus loves you. 
No. No. And there is a holy joy that can be ours. Absolutely. Thank you so much for saying that. I wasn't going to go there. You did, and I thank you for going there. Um, so those are questions that I would challenge each one of us to wrestle with. Am I seeking for the Spirit like that? And if yes, praise God. Keep at it. And if no, let's go there. Let's go there. We have a closing song, right? We invite you to stand as we sing page 289, The Savior is Waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart, why don't you let him come in, there's nothing for us to let you fully in and we're told that you want to pour out the spirit upon us father help us to have the wisdom and the spiritual discernment to see you moving amongst us father we've done a work and thank you for for entrusting us with that but father you want to give power to the work that we have never experienced before we need the Holy Spirit in a way, Father, that we could just see the movings and respond. And then, Father, we will have a power that is going to be just unbelievable. And it's going to be drawing people to you. And, Father, you want us to have the blessing of being a part of that. We need our hearts changed, Father. We need our emphasis changed, Father. We need a dose of your love and a dose of your joy. And people will say, I want that. Where did you get that from? Well, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about his spirit that he gives to his people. That's where that comes from. 
May you be glorified in each one of us, Father, as we move forward this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.